Katie Niebauer. I'm from the Department of Planning and Development, um, accompanied by Graham Owen, who you just heard talk. Um, he's also with the Department of Planning and Development. And our team focuses on comprehensive plan amendments. Um, but for this specific plan amendment, we are um, working in close coordination with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, so I would also like to welcome Megan Van Dam, who is the Affordable Housing Development Division Director, um, along with Grace Hyman, who is the Affordable and Workforce Housing Program Administrator. Um, and so just like Graham said, um, this is being recorded. And then the PowerPoint and the meeting recording will be posted on the plan amendment webpage um, following this meeting. Um, but just a little bit of background, um, we've been working on a comprehensive plan amendment um, that involves the workforce dwelling unit policy, um, specifically the for sale WDU program. And this is specifically related to the home ownership piece of the policy in the program. Um, so just providing kind of like a high level overview of this plan amendment. Um, and then we'll get into more details um, throughout the presentation. But um, there was a task force that was formed to kind of investigate concerns that were identified within the program, um, such as why units serving at the higher end of the income tiers were having difficulty selling um, and why they were staying on the market for so long. And so as further research occurred, the task force did identify additional challenges um, and then along with recommendations as well. Um, so the Board of Supervisors directed staff to incorporate the recommendations into the comprehensive plan amendment um, to, up, to update the policy, um, which we're going to go over in this presentation. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview. And then here's also an overview of the, of the agenda, the items that we're going to be kind of discussing um, during the presentation today. Um, so we're going to kind of start with an overview of what the for Workforce Dwelling Unit for Sale program is. Um, and how it's currently implemented. And then we're going to go into some of the housing and market analysis, um, which helped to identify some of the challenges, which then led to the task force recommendations. Um, and then we'll go ahead and address um, some of the some of the considerations as to how those task force recommendations would then be incorporated into the comprehensive plan amendment. Um, and then we'll go over the timeline for when we anticipate going public hearing with the, with these updates. Um, and then just of note, the draft plan text is published online, um, and that's going to stay online until April 3rd for the public comment period. Um, so um, we'll provide a link to where the draft plan text can be found, but it's on the web. It's on the um, workforce dwelling unit for sale program comprehensive plan webpage. Um, and then I'll also put my email in the chat as well. Um, so, so then um, you can email me with any questions or comments regarding the draft plan text. Um, and again, it's going to stay online until April 3rd. Um, and that's when we'll be receiving comments up until. Um, so now we'll go ahead and kind of get into the meat of the presentation today. So I'm going to pass it along to Grace. Thank you, Leah. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit first about the an overview of the WDU program itself. This program was approved by the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors and its policies are found in the comprehensive plan and related administrative guidelines. So the WDU program complements the affordable dwelling unit program, the ADU program uh, that's required by the zoning ordinance. And the WDU program has both a rental component and it has a for sale component. And today we really are only talking about updates to the WDU for sale program because the WDU rental program was updated fairly recently in 2021. So um, you can see the WDU policies apply to sort of these higher density planning areas like areas surrounding transit, metro stations, suburban centers, and community, um, community business centers. Um, and in these areas, developers can receive a bonus density of, you know, 12 to 20 percent above what is planned. So in that bonus could be used for additional residential units or it could be also used for non-residential purposes. And there's an expectation that residential development going through rezoning in these areas um, the, will provide at least 12 percent of units as 
ADUs, affordable dwelling units, or WDUs, workforce dwelling units. And if a redevelopment has both an affordable dwelling unit requirement and an expectation for WDUs, the number of ADUs is going to be that's that's required is calculated first, and any remaining units of that 12% is going to are going to be provided as WDUs. According to our current policy, for sale WDUs are expected to be provided at various income levels, and those range, um, you can see here on the left-hand side, between 60 and 120% of AMI. And for reference about what those AMIs mean, for in Fairfax County, for a family of four, the average income is 152,100, and that represents 100% of the area median income for a family of four. For a family of one, that that 100% um, of the area medium is income is 106 for a 450. Um, and those numbers um, are determined annually by HUD, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So we will be seeing um, in the um, in about a month or so an adjustment to those area median incomes determined by HUD. Fairfax County does adjust those numbers. They will take, we start with that 100% income and we adjust it for family size and income tiers. So in most of the county um, where 12% of the re residential development is expected to be provided as affordable units, um, the number of WDUs that's going to be provided is evenly split between 80, 100, and 100. 20% of AMI. So you can see in the column where it says countywide where there's 12% total units, 4% are um, at 120, 4% are expected to be at 100, and 4% are expected to be at 80% of AMI. In Tyson's non-high-rise developments, um, they have the deepest affordability and 20% of the units um, are expected. And you can see that there's 5% of the units are at 80, 100, 120% of the area median income, 3% at 70%, and 2% at 60. And um, in non in, in high-rise development Tyson's, we would expect to see 70, 80, and 100% of WDUs to be provided, 14% um, if they're on-site and 16% if they're off-site. And I do want to let you know that um, the the changes that we, when we were examining the WDU for sale program, we really did not look at the Tyson's high-rise um, uh, condos uh, because that that policy was recently also looked at. Um, and Leah, if you can advance the slide, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so you can see that once a development is approved through the zoning and construction begins, WDUs are offered for sale through um, the Department of Housing. The Department of Housing sets the sales prices of ADUs at each income tier, and the price um, is meant to be affordable to families at each of the income tiers. So WDUs are always priced below uh, the comparable market rate units in, in order to be affordable. WDUs are sold to income eligible buyers through our first time home buyer program and our affordable home ownership division programs. And the home ownership team is going to look at the total gross income of the family to determine what AMI, what income tier the family is. We look at the wages from, from employment, from self-employment. We look at benefits, social, social security, disability, veterans benefits. Um, we look at income that could be generated from assets. So for example, bank accounts, any investments that somebody has, savings accounts. If they have interest, that also counts as income, uh, at gross income that's counted towards their income tier and any regular mon monies coming in, any contribution to the family, whether it be a gift or a child support or any other money coming into the family counts as part of that determination of the family income. So the, the home ownership staff will look at the total income and decide which income tier the family belongs to. And that determines what ADU they can, per what WDU they can purchase, whether it's at 80, 100, or 120% of AMI. 
Um, yeah, can you can you advance? Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, so when somebody purchases a workforce dwelling unit through our program, because these units are offered at below market prices and we want to keep these affordable for a long period of time, there are covenants 30 year covenants associated with a property and these are agreements that the owner that purchased the property makes with the county to keep this unit affordable and we are going to require that the family that purchases this property occupies this property as their primary residence they have to certify to that occupancy on an annual basis the family is also agreeing to not overfinance the property. So we want to make sure that they only uh, um, finance to the outstanding principal balance of the property. And if the family decides to sell, which they could do at any time, they have to first offer it to sale back to the county so that we can then resell it to another um, family within the same AMI. So that when they resell the property, it must be sold um, at sort of a control price. And that is uh, a, an affordable price that at which they bought it, plus a certain index um, is, is added to that for each day that the, the person owns the property. After that 30 year period is over and um, you can, the, if you can advance, um, after the 30 year period of ownership, these families um, are no longer bound to occupy the property. So if they wanted to rent the unit, they could rent the unit out. Um, financing is also not no longer restricted to the the controlled value of the property because the pro these value these properties the WDUs are since the value is no longer controlled after the 30 year sort of have acquired a market value yeah. and um, the, the families can sell the unit and when they sell it, there will be an equity share split um, of the, the value of the property, the market value of the property. And that, that equity share actually helps us continue to provide affordable housing um, to other families in, in yeah. the program. Uh, can you advance? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Millie. So here you can yeah. see that um, when we, looked at the number of WDUs that had been provided to date. Um, we found that there were certain challenges in terms of um, units that had been provided. So we found that it, that units that were provided at different AMI levels sold at different rates. The, the WDUs that were sold um, at 70% of AMI families to 70 percent of AMI income tier sold very quickly. In fact, they sold out, um, you know, within 70, a little over 70 days. However, um, WDUs that were at higher income tiers took a significantly longer time period to sell. And especially the higher income tier, 120 uh, percent of AMI, these units were taking, you know, over a year to sell, and this meant that the the, the developers were holding onto these units for a, a very significant long period of time, and it was just, um, affecting their finances. Um, we have we found other challenges to the WDUs also. Um, Leah, can you advance? Sorry, sorry. So in addition to the length of time that it was taking to sell the units, um, the sellers, the the developers and builders that were creating these WDUs um, were required to provide sales incentives to get these units um, to 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 sell, especially at the higher income tiers. So they tried a number of um, things to get the units sold, and sometimes they would reduce the sales price, or they would give seller credits, pay for closing costs or condo fees, um, and or they would lower the AMI. And we found that as the AMI level went up, the incentives required to to get these units sold um, increased significantly. So of the units that we had, um, of the 120% AMI units, almost all of them required some kind of seller incentive to get sold. So we found these things quite challenging for um, both our program staff to be able to get the units sold and for the developers to continue to carry um, these, these properties. And um, we knew that we were going to have a um, very healthy pipeline of WDUs coming 
um, down the pike and we were looking to ways that we could improve the program and make it is going to get into some of the, the actions that we as staff took and to you know to better improve our program. Thank you, Grace. Uh, my name is Megan Van Dam. As Leah mentioned, I'm uh, work also work with Grace in the Housing Department. I'm the Affordable Housing Development Division Director, and I'll I'll talk a little bit about, uh, as Grace mentioned, uh, uh, what we are what we did um, to uh, address the concerns that uh, were raised and the challenges that were raised that Grace mentioned. So, step one. Um, there was a, the Board of Supervisors for the county uh, convened a task force and asked staff to convene a task force to look at the, the issue uh, that Grace mentioned about the challenges to the units that are set um, and, and committed um, at the higher AMI levels. The task force was uh, a mixture of representatives from the development industry uh, who are building the WDUs as part of a larger market rate development, as well as affordable housing providers and advocates and staff. And the task force was chaired by uh, Planning Commissioner C Candace Bennett, as well as our Deputy Director for Real Estate Finance and Development, Anna Shapiro. Uh, so they, the group looked at the, the uh, challenges to the higher AMI units um, and also recognized that there were a few other challenges to the program related to uh, our the ability to have uh, commitments for larger family size units within the program um, and the need for those family size units within the program and uh, also um, looking at where these units were being produced and um, uh, throughout the county uh, as two of the two additional policy areas. Um, and then uh, uh, the third bullet uh, that the task force looked at was uh, trying to um, uh, look at the trying to right size the pricing schedule for the units because as we're all aware um, the uh, area median income has increased over time as well as interest rates have increased and uh, other things like the the ta other inputs into the pricing schedule like uh, the tax rate have increased as well uh, so we wanted to make sure we had um, a, an adequate uh, pricing schedule for that. Uh, that last piece is more administrative, uh, so this presentation really focuses on the uh, the first three, the WDUs at higher AMIs and their ability to sell, as well as the proportionality and geographic equity. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, uh, there were consultants hired to assist with the task force and look at uh, where the housing market is right now. And uh, primarily uh, uh, we looked at uh, home sales and how that compared to incomes and and what uh, what residents um, and buyers are uh, able to afford. So this is a slide that summarizes uh, median home sales within the county for the past five years, um, and we looked at the countywide average as well as different submarkets throughout the county. And there is a there is some variation uh, across the county, but on average, uh, the uh, median home sales prices have gone up over the past five years by approximately about 23 percent. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, relative to income, uh, we looked. Here's a chart that rep that represents how income has changed over time. Uh, it's a bit of a longer look, but um, you can see that incomes have also gone up. Uh, that there is some variation in the the county, but overall, uh, incomes ha uh, have gone up. Um, the challenge, though, is that uh, incomes have not increased as quickly as uh, home sale prices have increased. So within the same time period, incomes have only increased about 14, 15 percent relative to that 23 percent uh, home sales price increase. Next slide, please. Um, and, and if you're interested in the submarkets, uh, you can see here they are uh, across the county. So we looked at the Chantilly, Dulles, Herndon area, Tyson's and Richmond Highway as submarkets. Next slide, please. And we also looked at uh, where where median renter incomes were relative, where they were, uh, and which were, I should say, lower than the county average. Uh, so renter, median renter incomes are at 88,000 versus on average, um, the median household income across the county was about 131,000. So there is a, a bit of a difference. And overall, we looked at, we wanted to see what it would cost on average to purchase a home or what, what excuse me, what a uh, household's income uh, would be 
uh, needed to purchase a home on average within the county, and um, that is approximately two hundred and eighteen thousand uh, in as of last year. So there's there's quite a disparity between uh, renter income, average household income, and what is needed to purchase a home, uh, and that increase has uh, grown dramatically um, since 2021. Uh, and I think we're well aware of uh, housing challenges uh, during COVID and, and demands, uh, increase in demands uh, over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the task force I mentioned, there are those three policy challenges that we looked at, the affordability levels, the geography, and the family size units. Uh, so as we have the next three slides go through each of them, what the challenges uh, were, how the task force looked at it, and then also their recommendation. So for this first challenge about the affordability levels, uh, Grace and I both mentioned that at the for the units that are set at and committed to at the higher um, area median income levels that those stay on the market longer and they often require uh, seller incentives so, uh, in order to to sell the units um, we also recognized that there is a significant demand for units uh, uh, at or below the 80 percent level um, and how quickly those units uh, sell within the program uh, so the task force looked um, mainly at uh, how the the prices um, and the affordability of units at those at each of the income tiers, how that compares to what's available at the in the private market. And um, this chart shows it represents uh, looking at um, at home sales, affordable home sales prices for each of the AMI tiers, and uh, what home, what share of homes uh, within the private market are available for at each of those price points. So, uh, when we looked at, uh, at this is an example for a two-bedroom home, um, but what we looked at and what we found really was that one out of almost every two homes within uh, the the um, last three years has sold uh, at a price that would be affordable. And when we say affordability, we talk about a household spending no more than 30% of its income um, on household expenses, house, mortgage and taxes and things like that, utilities. And uh, what, we, what we see is that um, one out of every two homes would be priced at a point that was um, at or below the, the 120 percent um, area median income level. So there is availability on the market, on the open market for for at that at that price point. Um, but uh, on average, the um, availability of homes that have sold in the last three years, um, that, that has gone down, uh, that goes down as you move down the, the income tiers. So there are fewer homes that are available for households that are making the area median income or below. Um, and that is quite a challenge. So one out of every four homes would only be available to a household that's at that area median income level and that's less for a household that's making only 80% of the area median income. And I'll, I'll say that we also found uh, that when we looked at example three bedrooms, so what we call a family size units, so three bedroom units or more, uh, that the availability of homes was even less uh, for, um, for or the availability of homes was less uh, when we're looking at those family sized units and really at, at the 80 percent and the 100 percent of the ami um, income level that only 14 percent of the homes that were three bedrooms or more were um, available at that for those price affordable price points for those households uh, next slide please and we also looked at uh, what was being produced in the um, well, I should say what what is being uh, what is expected from the policy in terms of the um, in terms of the workforce dwelling units versus what's being produced, and so you can see that uh, on uh, that the program uh, in general has an expectation for equal. Um, equal amounts of units being produced at the 80, 100, and 120% of area median income levels. But what's being produced is actually more units at the 80 and the 100% AMI levels and fewer units and expectations for the, the higher income tiers already. 
Um, and we actually have some units that are being committed to our program at 70% of the area median income tiers. And that may be uh, during, during a, since these units are produced during uh, a rezoning proposal as it's, it's reviewed um, and moved through that process, uh, that there might be some negotiations happening uh, for um, uh, units to be set at lower um, at to, and serving uh, uh, households with lower income tiers at that 70% AMI. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I actually, actually, I'm sorry, go back, uh, Leah. Go back one more. Sorry about that. So what the uh, task for, after looking at all these considerations, uh, the task force recommended that um, that the uh, ex the policy for where the area median income range um, should be for the program, that it should be shifted. So right now it's that 80, 100 and 120 percent area median income. Uh, ranges and the task force recommended shifting that down to 70, 80, and 100 percent of area median income levels. And that was in part due to the fact that uh, units are available uh, at the 120 percent um, level already uh, in the open market, and likely home buyers uh, will opt uh, to to buy it uh, if they can um, if they can purchase a home on the open market um, typically they they will do so rather than entering the program um, and since the program is actually is already producing the 70 percent AMI tiers um, we also uh, looked at shifting the um, the area median income down uh, to that um, and we we are well aware of the demand at that level um, keep going and you can skip two I think Yep, there we go. So um, as far as the the second policy challenge, this related to the ability of the program to uh, produce um, family sized units. So units that are that are accommodating families um, of and have three bedrooms or more. Uh, and so within the policy, right, or what, what's being produced right now is a lack of uh, sufficient family sized affordable units to meet the demand. Um, and that's in part uh, we realize because there's the policy does not speak to um, having uh, proportionality between the affordable bedroom, the, the units um, and the, the affordable units, uh, the bedroom mix um, being proportional to the bedroom mix of the market rate units within the, the same uh, development. That that policy really only exists within uh, the, the one particular area, which is in the Tyson's uh, urban center plan. And without that proportionality, it's it's very difficult for uh, for the county to negotiate for uh, the ability to to produce the the WDUs that are uh, family sized units. So what we may have is a development that has market rates at one, two, three bedroom units, but then we're we're not getting um, the proportional number of uh, one, two, three bedroom units within uh, their affordability commitments. Um, so that creates a problem because we do have families that are in need of those larger units and we don't have the units available to that would accommodate them. Uh, we also realized that within the program, um, the, if we are having units that have uh, two, three or more uh, bedrooms. Um, if we do are able to uh, negotiate for those those units that they still may not accommodate families because the living areas and the bedroom sizes may be too small to functionally accommodate um, the household size. So we, as I mentioned, we looked at the demand for these larger units and we did see that the majority overall of larger of units that are um, produced within the county are uh, larger units. So they, the majority of the units have three, four, five bedrooms. So there is a demand within the county and we're well aware of that based on our, our, uh, our applicant pools as well. So we're looking to, and what the task force recommended, uh, is looking to expand um, the, gu the guidance uh, from that exists within the Tyson's plan currently to make that a countywide expectation so that we would have uh, bedroom mixed proportionality between the WDUs and the market rate units. 
Um, and we looked at the the fiscal, the financial impact of that, um, and there was an impact to uh, the developments, but they still remained feasible. So we are moving forward with that recommendation, except for uh, when we looked at uh, developments that had larger four or five bedroom units. Um, when we when we looked at ex having a, having an expectation for uh, units that WDUs that would have four and five bedroom units, uh, that did create challenges for the development overall. So because of that, the task force recommend re recommended a, kind of a caveat onto the this recommendation that would allow for flexibility uh, for family sized units that are three or more bedrooms. So if you have if a developer is, is has a proposal with units that have four and five bedrooms, there wouldn't be a strict proportionality expected for that the um, the amount of of uh, uh, workforce dwelling units. Uh, and then also uh, adding on to that recommendation, we're also looking to have minimum bedroom sizes and minimum living room sizes uh, added to the policy so that we could make sure that if we are getting these larger uh, units with more with uh, three bedrooms or um, that those units can actually accommodate and functionally accommodate a family. Um, and finally, we also realized that within certain developments that have a combination of different unit types, say, for example, they might have townhouses and stacked townhouses or triplexes and uh, multi or multifamily units, that there's a lot of uh, transferring of unit types. Uh, so all of the affordable units in the townhouses might be transferred into stacked townhouses or uh, or um, condos or, or apartments, um, rental apartments, thereby we're losing our opportunity, certain opportunities to have uh, certain unit types within our program and uh, some and occasionally also lo losing a home, home ownership opportunity altogether if they're transferred into a rental development. So we're looking to craft language as well that could uh, set some parameters and circumstances for when that transfer might happen. Next slide, please. And then the final task force recommendation that they that was made uh, related to the geographic applicability of the uh, policy. Um, Grace mentioned that the geography for this policy uh, is limited to uh, development centers. So uh, those that would be Tyson's or the transit stations within the county, uh, community business centers, or some of the more dense suburban areas. Um, this map is the southern part of our county and shows in white, uh, just south of the Beltway, moving down um, the uh, uh, Richmond Highway Corridor area, Route 1, uh, also Springfield and Franconia, Kingstown, and then also Lorton. And so the white areas are, you can see the limitations to where this policy uh, applies to within the southern part of the county. But what we're seeing is that there is development that is proposed uh, occasionally that is similar in density to the medium and, and um, high densities that are uh, planned for the areas that are within these development centers. So uh, what we're, what's happening is that we don't have an abil ability to negotiate for affordable units within those developments because our policy doesn't speak to that, um, even though there's comparable densities that are being proposed. So uh, we wanted to see if there could be more a more equitable approach to where the where this might where the policy might apply and where we might be able to produce these workforce units. Uh, and um, what we what we looked at was really what are the sales values of comparable comparable developments within development centers and then just outside. And uh, we look the sales prices are uh, generally the same. Um, in some cases, they were higher. So uh, when we look at potential like financial impacts to a project if it were to add on WDUs, overall uh, the sales prices may not, it may not affect the sales prices uh, uh, too much. So uh, the recommendation of the task force ultimately was to um, expand the program to areas that are zoned or planned for that medium and high density residential development at eight dwelling units per acre or greater. 
Um, and um, what we are looking at and refining that as, as part of the staff recommendation is to limit it to areas that are planned for that medium and high density dwelling units per acre or more, just because if it's already zoned for that density, then uh, the policy wouldn't apply. Uh, we wouldn't retroactively expect that's something that a development would uh, d to commit to um, affordable units if it's already zoned for, for that uh, density. Um, the task force also looked at the Tyson's um, high-rise condo policy to see if there would be some expectation to expand this policy outside of Tyson's and ultimately uh, decided that uh, because of the market for high-rise um, condos, which is, is very limited in the county, that we didn't want to expand that. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll turn it over to Graham now. Uh, uh, Graham will cover uh, a summary of the plan amendment considerations as well as uh, the next steps before we open it up the forum to um, questions. Graham. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Appreciate it. So the comprehensive plan amendment that is under review would consider the recommendations of the task force that Megan just reviewed, um, as well as some related changes. So that would include shifting the affordability level uh, ranges from that 80% and 120% AMI uh, down to the range that we had discussed, which is 70% to 100% of AMI. And that's while retaining that 12% commitment level that's currently recommended for for sale WDUs. Um, the amendment would um, propose to expand guidance on room sizes in WDUs, so encouraging proportionality of bedroom counts between uh, WDUs and market rent units that are in a development to try to encourage, you know, functionally, uh, functionally uh, attractive um, units for families. Um, this would also be accomplished by adding a minimum bedroom size and a living room size. Um, to help to make those units more attractive for uh, families. And then that change would also be made to the rental side of the WDU program for consistency. Um, so as we've described, um, the amendment would make the WDU program applicable to areas that are outside of our activity centers that are planned for eight units to the acre or greater, um, as well as you know, continue to have guidance about um, locating WDUs within our activity centers. Um, and the amendment, as Megan mentioned, would continue to allow WDUs to be transferred um, to rental products um, when you have those uh, multi, uh, multi unit, multi type uh, developments that come in. Um, if it's found that providing WDUs in a for sale product is infeasible, uh, but the county would like to be a part of that discussion um, on the on the transfer um, explicitly when that when that occurs. Um, finally, um, certain areas of the county, including Tyson's, Maryfield, uh, and then the Dulles Suburban Center currently allow monetary contributions uh, to the Housing Trust Fund in lieu of providing WDUs, although this is a very infrequent uh, practice. So um, the amendment would do one change there, um, update the contribution amount that's recommended in the Maryfield plan to 3%, which would be consistent with the Tyson's recommendation. Uh, and then last thing, um, there are a number of editorial changes that are proposed throughout the plan to update terminology, uh, facts and data, and then some uh, cleanup um, cleanup changes that we'd make to avoid repetition um, in the area plans. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to drop the link to the actual text here um, in the chat. So if you want to take a look at it, feel free. Um, but just in general, uh, this amendment in, in conclusion um, would improve the existing program by better matching the program's affordability levels with the community's needs. Um, it also help uh, the program by reducing carrying costs and the need to provide incentives uh, by targeting the household income tiers that have the greater demand for WDUs. Um, and then it would also explicitly align policy with the affordability levels that are already being proffered to in the rezoning process, where uh, Megan noted we're already seeing commitments at those lower AMI levels uh, now. And so the policy is here to kind of catch up to that, that practice. Um, so the changes would impact the housing and the land use elements of the policy plan, which is our countywide guidance, and then also um, in the area plan volumes that you have listed here, uh, where we have unique WDU recommendations, such as in Tyson's, Annadale, uh, Seven Corners, et cetera. Um, and then these changes are going to be paired with uh, changes in the administrative guidelines that help uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development um, run and administer the WDU program. So there's some some guidance in here that would be in the policy and then some that's in the in the guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a timeline showing the next steps. Um, so the text is available for co public comment now through uh, April the 7th. 
Um, I did drop a link to it in the um, in the chat, and Leah just um, Leah just put a, a comment in here. If you do have any questions on the text or the amendment, um, you can email Leah, uh, and she'll be able to uh, take your comments. And if you have any questions, we'll respond to them. Um, we have been conducting community engagement on the amendment since February. Um, that continues now uh, with these um, with these open house discussions. And then we're going to be bringing this uh, amendment to the Planning Commission's Housing Committee for a discussion in April so they can uh, review the draft changes. Um, we'll publish a staff report in May and then have an initial discussion with the board's Housing Committee in June. Um, that's all in advance of the formal public hearings, uh, which are scheduled right now for uh, June 12th for the Planning Commission and then July 16th for the Board of Supervisors. Um, so with that, um, if you could go to the next slide, Leah, um, here are the contact uh, contact information for Megan with Housing and Community Development and then Leah uh, with the Department of Planning and Development. So uh, unless anybody has uh, anything else on the panel's uh, panel side, we're happy to answer any questions. And if you do uh, have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand in the um, and we'll be able to mm -hmm. call on you. There's a little button on the top right hand corner of your screen that should say raise and that will let us know that you have a question. everybody's hungry. Well, if there aren't any questions, um, thank you all. Really uh, appreciate your time. If you, And once again, we will uh, provide a link to the video um, on the WDU for sale amendment website. Um, so if you want to review it and have any questions that come to mind um, afterwards, I will also post the presentation. Uh, but feel free to email us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.